Hello there and welcome back to session number five of the Love of God teaching series. And the session today is entitled The Price for His Delight. If you remember in our previous sessions, we discussed about how you and I are God's delight. And we seen in our last session how Jesus Christ came and bought us with a price. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. And if you have your Bibles ready, let's read it together. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And you can read from whatever English translation you have available. Let's read it together. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The question today in this session is, what was that price? What did it cost Jesus to purchase back his delight? That's what we're trying to answer today in this session. Let's read also Matthew chapter 13 verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The Bible says that Jesus sold everything to buy the whole world so that he can get his treasure, the church, a people that will receive his love and a people that will love him back. And we saw that he gave up everything in heaven, his father, his heaven to come down the earth. And then he gave up, he gave up his life, his own life at the cross and he allowed himself to be tortured for our sakes and that's what we're going to study today and to see into more detail uh, and um, let's read also from john verse uh, chapter 10 verse 11 i am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep and ephesians 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives just as christ also loved the church and gave himself for for her what did Jesus allow to happen to himself to pay for us? In simple terms, we could say that he, according to these verses, that he gave up himself. The answer to that question is himself. He gave up his life. But we, I would like us to go into a little bit more detail and see what exactly happened there and what exactly was the, co the cost of the purchase, the cost of, of purchasing us. And to do that, uh, let's open also at Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 44. And let's read it together slowly, verse by verse. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Getsman and said to the disciples, which now by now were just 11 because the, the uh, one Judah betrayed him. So he said to them, sit here while I go and pray over there. Let's stop a little bit here in verse 36. We see the word Getsman which means olive press. And the word garden in the expression, the garden of Getsman, the, that word garden means guarded in Hebrew. So the garden of Getsman would translate now into the guarded place of the olive trees. And it was guarded usually because growing olive trees in that time, and even in our days to grow olive trees is pretty expensive. And it was an expensive business which needed protection from thieves and from other uh, evil people. But now let's see, what is an olive press? Getsman means olive press. And there are different types of, uh, from what I, I've seen in, the, in uh, researching, but one type would look like a big stone uh, hollowed a little bit on the interior in which they would dump the olives of the olives and then they would have this other large stone like a wheel roll around and crush crush the olives and allow for the oil to flow into a vat and then they would wait for the oil to separate from the water so that wheel would come and crush all those olives and there are other types too another olive press method would be putting multiple baskets full of olives, one on top of each other, and the weight of the baskets would crush the olives and allow for the oil again to flow into the vats, and there would, they would wait for the oil to come uh, at the surface to separate from water. And I don't think it's a co coincidence that Jesus comes this night into this guarded place, a place that evidently had some walls around it, and it was a place of pressure. Even for Jesus, it was a place of great pressure. And as we'll continue to read, we will see that that's exactly what happened to Jesus. Let's continue our reading in verse 37. 
And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. I should stop at this juncture and tell you something interesting about the Bible that you should always remember. That the Bible never exaggerates. The Bible never exaggerates. Exaggeration is, is a kind of lie, is a form of lie, because when you stretch the truth, the truth is no longer the truth. It, is it contaminated? It's stretched. It's compromised. So when the Bible uses extreme words like sorrowful, deeply distressed, like in this verse, that's really how it was. There's no exaggeration there. Jesus was indeed sorrowful and deeply distressed. Let's see verse 38. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. We see in verse 38 that Jesus said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to even to death. In other words, Jesus is saying, inside I have such pressure, uh, such sorrow in my heart that I feel like I'm going to die. That's what is, is Jesus saying here. Why would he feel like that? Because not too long from now, the mob of people would come. He knows that already. The mob would come and, uh, and arrest him and brutally torture him until the morning when he was going to be crucified, put on the cross and die one of the worst forms of execution known to man, crucifying, crucifixion. Can you imagine if you knew all that is going to happen to you? Can you imagine what would, would that feel like? Can you put yourself in Jesus' shoes, put yourself in his place, and knowing that all that suffering is going to happen to you? How would you feel? So he knows this is what is going to happen to him, but he's, he's still human. He's fully God and fully fully human. That's why he experienced sorrow. He experienced distress. He experienced sadness, even feeling like dying. And many, many people have this idea that when Jesus was on the cross, he did, it didn't really hurt him because he was God. It wasn't really painful. It was mostly an act, but that's not true at all because the Bible says he was fully God and fully human. He experienced the pain as we experience pain. And he really became a human being. He didn't have rubber hands hanging on the cross. Uh, and, he wasn't, and he wasn't acting pain like in a drama, like we see in a movie, like in a theater drama. He wasn't acting. He was really experiencing pain for our sake. He was really bleeding and suffering. And it, it wasn't just physical pain. It was also emotional pain. It was spiritual pain because he was being separated from his father, from the presence of the father. And also all our sin, all the human, human race's sin were past, present and future. All the sins of the world were put on him, were brought on this one place in time and put on this one man at one time. How would that feel like? Can you imagine how would that feel like? I don't think we, we get any idea, we have any idea how, and we will never know how much pressure, how much suffering was on the shoulder of Jesus when physical pain, the sins of the world, everything was put on him, on one man, at one time, in this one particular time. Then let's see the expression in verse 38, watch with me. Why did Jesus say that to the disciples? Because he didn't know exactly when this, is when this was going to happen. He knew what was going to happen, but he didn't know exactly the moment when the mob would come, even though he was God. And so we see here that this was not a script. This is real. This is something that happened for real and was really happening. Let's continue reading at verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So we see in this verse 39 that Jesus collapsed down to his face, not even on his knees, down to his face. He felt the same emotions that you and I feel and would feel in such a situation. Why would I want to die? What, why would he want to die for some people? For this world, 
I mean, why would you want to be tormented or tortured? Why would you? It was only because of love. So the first thing that he says to his father, like a, like a human, is let this cup, let this assignment, let this uh, suffering pass from me. Depart from me if it's possible. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So we see his so he was so in such in so much anguish, in so much suffering. And um, let's finish reading verse 14. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? So we see that he prayed uh, uh, around an hour before he came back to his disciples. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. So it seems like he prayed around two or three hours to get strengthened, to get encouraged, to, to be built up in faith, to be able to face such a difficult task, such a difficult assignment from God. Now, this is the record of the Gospel of Matthew. However, Luke, who was a physician, who was a doctor, brings up a detail that the other Gospels don't mention. And let's open our Bibles at Luke chapter 22, verse 44, and read it together. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So we see this detail that is mentioned only in Luke, that his sweat became, drop, became drops of blood falling down to the ground. And I would like to read an explanation from a medical doctor, uh, uh, Dr. C. Truman Davis, an explanation of, about Getzman, uh, uh, which says this about this, uh, this phenomenon of the drops of blood, of sweat, we, uh, which has become uh, blood. The physical passion of Christ began in Getzman. Of the many aspects of his initial suffering, the one which is of particular uh, physiological interest is the bloody sweat. Interestingly enough, the physician Saint Luke is the only evangelist to mention this occurrence. Every attempt imaginable has been used by modern scholars to explain away the phenomenon of bloody sweat, apparently under the mistaken impression that it simply does not occur, does not happen. A great deal of effort could be saved by consulting the medical literature. Though, the, though, the, uh, though very rare, the phenomenon of hematidrosis hem, or bloody sweat is well documented. Under great emotion, emotional stress, tiny capillaries in the sweat glands can break, thus mixing blood with sweat. This process alone could have produced marked weakness and possible shock. This is what Dr. Truman says, Truman David says about this phenomenon, uh, drops of blood. And that's true. I honestly, many times when I read that passage, I didn't really believe that they became drops of blood. How could that happen? But it seems that that really happened. Some of the tiny capillaries in, on, on, on his head burst out, broke because of the stress, because of the sorrow, because of the um, pain, emotional pain that he was experiencing. Let's open at the, our Bibles at Matthew chapter 26 in the same chapter and continue reading verses 45 to 47. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. So by this time we see that Jesus was strengthened. He was determined. He got his resolve to go and suffer for the human race. And we see further on in verses 57 to 67. Let's read it together. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, 
the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put, you, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of, of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now we have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat on his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands. I want you to get inside this story, to feel what, try to feel what Jesus felt to go through his suffering in detail and see what he had to suffer for our sake, for you and me. He didn't have to do that, but he still chose to do that. Even though it was hard for him to leave heaven, to leave the place of glory, to leave his father, to get separated from his father so that he would get us back, win us back, his treasure, the church. Uh, also, read, let's continue reading in Matthew 27, the next chapter, in verses 22 to 26. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a uh, tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this, of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scored Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. How many of you watched the movie The Passion of Christ? That movie does an outstanding job of, depi of depicting the phenomenon of scourging, or some, which is sometimes called flogging. How was Jesus scourged, as this passage says? How was Jesus flogged? So what they would do is take a prisoner and bind him, tie him to a whipping post, and then a Roman soldier who was trained in doing this, in doing scourging, would take one of the instruments, and in most cases, the scourging, scourging would be done by something called a cat of nine tails, which was a kind of handle with nine, with nine leather straps coming out of it, nine leather straps, which at the end of those straps, there would be sharp, sharp objects like bone, uh, glass, and metal, bone, metal, and glass. And he would take this weapon, and he would have different techniques on how to scourge a person, uh, on how to punish this victim. And by the way, Roman crucifixion wasn't for Romans. Uh, the primary purpose of crucifixion was to let everybody know that they should not mess with the Romans. So Romans were not crucified. Only all the other people. In other words, this is what was going to happen to you if you would challenge the Romans. So crucifixion was a special execution type made for a, a prepare for a primary purpose. So this soldier could take this weapon and just scrape it on your back or, or, or on the sides of Jesus as you see in the movie so that those sharp objects would tear apart flesh as you see, as you probably saw in the movie, flesh from here, from his back and that would cause much, much pain. Imagine nine ladder straps with sharp objects coming on all, on all, all your back and on the sides and take, uh, ripping up uh, your flesh 
What pain, what, what suffering was there? Let's continue our reading in verse 27 and 28. Then the soldiers of the government took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Remember that this, were, this person was the creator, the, the father, the Jesus Christ, the person of wisdom, the, the master craftsman who created all this world, all the world with all the flavor and scents, with all the aromas and smell and taste for, the, for people to enjoy. This was the creator, not just any person. He was our creator, suffering, spitting from, from out, being stripped. Verses 29 to 30. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. Notice in verse 30, and it doesn't say that one person spat on him, but they all spat on him. They all mocked him. And stripped him and made him suffer. Let's read also in Luke chapter 22 verses 63 to 65. Now the man who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. They mocked him. They tortured him. And Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6 says this, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. They plucked out his beard. Can you imagine that? How shameful that? How despising is that? I did not hide my face from shame and from spitting. Whenever you feel like you're facing trouble, or problems and trials or unfair judgments from people. Think about Jesus. How unfair was he treated for your sake? And don't look at people. Look at Jesus. If you ever do something for people, don't look at them. Don't expect them to, to pay you back or to reward you or to thank you. If you do something for people, do it for Jesus. Because you love Jesus. He loved you and you love him back. And people are his most treasure, most precious possession. The people are his treasure. And if you do something for them, do it out of love for Jesus. Because he cares for them. And we should care for other people too. Because he, God the Father, pour, pours out his love into our hearts. And we can love by his grace. We can love people as he loved people. Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 15 verse 25 says this. Now it was the third hour and they crucified him. The, th uh, the third hour, that is nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. So he spent a whole night being in suffering and tormented, being mocked, being spat on, scourged, flogged, stripped down, put a crown of thorns on his head. And at, at nine o'clock in the morning, he was crucified. And again, this medical doctor explains crucifixion. Let's listen to, what, to his explanation. The heavy patibulum of the cross was tied across his shoulders. The procession of the condemned Christ, two thieves, uh, thieves and the execution detail of the Roman soldiers headed by a centurion began its slow journey along the route which we know today as the uh, Via Dolorosa. In spite of Jesus' efforts to walk erect, the weight of the heavy wooden beam together with the shock produced by the copious loss of blood, was too much. He stumbled and fell. The rough wood of the beam gouged into the lacerated skin and muscles of the shoulders. He tried to rise, but human muscles have been pushed beyond their endurance. The centurion, anxious to proceed with the crucifixion, selected a stalwart North American on look, North Af African onlooker, uh, Simon of Cyrene, to carry the cross. Jesus followed, still bleeding and sweating the cold, clammy sweat of shock. 
The 650-yard journey from the fortress Antonia to Golgotha was finally completed. The prisoner was again stripped of his clothing except for a loincloth which was allowed the Jews. The crucifixion began. Jesus was offered nine wine mixed with myrrh, a mild analgesic pain-relieving mixture, and he refused the drink. Simon was ordered to place the patibulum on the ground and Jesus was quickly thrown backward with his shoulder against the wood. The legionnaire fell for the depression of the, at the front of the wrist. He drove a heavy square wrought iron nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly, he moved to the other side and repeated the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly but to allow some flexion and movement. But the patibulum was then lifted into place at the top of the stipes and the title is reading, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, was nailed into place. The left foot was pressed backwards against the right foot. With both feet extended, toes down, a nail was driven through the arch of each leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim was now crucified. As Jesus slowly sagged down with more weight on the nails in the wrists, excruciating, fiery pain, shot along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrists were putting pressure on the median nerve, large nerve trunks which traversed the mid-wrist and hand. And hand. And he, as he pushed himself upward to avoid this stretching torment, he placed his full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, there was searing agony as the nail tore through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of his feet. At this point, another phenomenon occurred. As the arms fatigued, great waves of cramps swept over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps came the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by the arm, the pectoral muscles, the large muscles of the chest, were paralyzed and the intercoastal muscles, the small muscle between the ribs, were unable to act. Air could be drawn into the lungs but could not be exhaled. Jesus fought to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Can you imagine that? Finally, the carbon dioxide level increased in the lungs, lungs and in the bloodstream and the cramps partially subsided. A sponge soaked in Posca, the cheap sour wine that was the staple drink of the Roman legionnaires, legionnaires was lifted to Jesus' lips. His body was now in extremis and he could feel the chill, chill of death creeping through his tissues. This realization brought forth his sixth word. Possibly little more than a tortured whisper. It is finished. His mission of atonement had been completed. Finally, he could allow his body to die. All of this the Bible records with the simple words. And they crucified him. And they crucified him. Let's continue our reading. Open and read at Romans chapter 5 verses 6 to 8. Let's read it together. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for, uh, for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinner, sinners, Christ died for us. I want to read this line, this last line again. But God, the Father, demonstrates, proves his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has love towards us. Not punishment, not anger, not offense. Because of his great love towards us, he sent Christ to die for us. And Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Many of you, and including myself, might have replaced in your mind in this verse the word shame with pain in verse 2. Reading it like that he was despising the pain, not the shame, but the pain. But this is not true. I think Jesus despised the shame. He was embarrassed because he was proposing to the church when he was sitting on the cross, hanging on the cross. He was actually proposing the church. He was humbling himself and kneeling towards us to tell us that he would be privileged to be with us for all eternity. He would be privileged to be with us for all eternity. He despised the shame for our sake. He didn't, he didn't look at himself when he did that, when he humbled to the cross. Why did he do it? Why did he do this? I heard, say, I heard people say that the joy that he was looking forward in his verse, uh, it was to go back and be, and be with his father in heaven. Is that true? Is that true that he, want, he wanted to be with his father? That's not, that, that's not what it was. The joy that he was looking forward to was not to be back with his father because he was always with the father. He didn't have to come down to suffer for us. But his joy, can you remember another word for joy from our previous sessions? His joy, his delight was who? Us, the sons of men, people. So the joy that he was looking forward to was us, was the church, was his treasure. The sons of men, the pe people that he loves so much and that he wants to be with. He wants, to, he wants them to receive his love and to be loved by him. He did it for you and for me. We were his joy and his delight. And if there was only one person on this earth, he would still die for that person to save him him or her and Ephesians 5 25 to verse 32 says that Christ gave his life for his bride that was the joy that was before him his bride the church was the joy that he was looking forward to after his suffering and Isaiah the chapter 53 53 verse 4 to 5 says this let's read it together surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Look how many our, our griefs, our sorrows, our transgressions, our iniquities, our peace. And we are healed by Jesus' stripes. He wanted health and he wanted to heal us. He wanted help for us. And he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to come to do that. But he wanted to do this. So the point of all this series, and we are wrapping up this series today. This is the last session from this series. And the point of this whole series is, is that Jesus really loved us. Jesus really loves you and me. And he loved us that much. He loves you that much. And he's saying to you, I want to heal you. I want to forgive you. I want to restore you. I want to make you whole again. I want, I want to, uh, you to have victory. I want good things for you. I want you to have success. I want you to be victorious, overcomer. And I would do anything to forgive you. To forgive your sins and to save you. Can you imagine that? Can you tell yourself that? Jesus loves me not just anybody Jesus loves you and Jesus loves me so we saw in the, our in the first in the, uh, the first session of this series that God was not just a, a powerful crea creator an intelligent and creative creator but he was a loving God a loving creator who created all this world with all the animals and plants and diversity and variety and flavors and scents, tastes, smell, landscapes, nature for our sakes, for us to enjoy. And then we saw in session two, the person of wisdom who was the master craftsman who created all this world with, together with God the Father. And that person was no, no one but Jesus, the Word, Jesus Christ. And we saw how 
man fell into sin and right there at that point Jesus Christ the voice that was walking in the garden in that moment instead of being angry with Adam decided to come and save him and gave that powerful promises promise in Genesis 3 15 that one day he would come again and make war with Satan to save us back to win us back he could have left us uh, to die in hell because he said the, the the penalty for sin is death in hell he he could have forsaken us but he didn't and he gave that promise and then in session three in God's dream for man we saw how God was searching for friends for Enoch Noah Abraham the people of Israel King David and then culminated with Jesus and in Zechariah all the way from in the Old Testament from beginning to end he announced he's announcing that he would send someone to, to be a savior for us the church and finally in session four we see Jesus Christ becoming flesh becoming the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us becoming human and he came to get married to to propose to the church by giving himself to the cross to die for us to get us back and then in the future we will be sitting in Revelation says that we will be sitting at the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb of God. We will be there. Right now we're engaged to Jesus Christ but everyone who got born again who came into a personal relationship with Christ who accepted the gospel proposal will be there and, and there's such a blessing to be there. If you accepted that invitation and you are there at the marriage supper of the Lamb, you, the Bible says in Revelation you are blessed. And today in our last session we saw the whole process of crucifixion, the sufferings of Jesus. All to say this point that He loves you and He loves me. And I want you to never forget that. Every time when you feel discouraged, when, when you feel attacked, depressed, when you feel like uh, uh, things are not fair to you, people are not fair to you, or God is not fair to you, or why did God allow this and that? Remember that God never wants evil things for you. He is never tempted to do evil to you, to do bad things to you. He never does that. He loves you. He has only love for you. Otherwise he wouldn't have sacrificed everything. The Bible says in John 3 16 that God gave, he loved the, the world so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for us so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So he gave everything. His, his delight, His daily delight, Jesus Christ, His own Son, He sacrificed it for your sake and for my sake. What a great love He lavished on us. So I want you to remember this and take this to heart, meditate on this, on how much the Father and Jesus Christ loves us. And I would like to close this session with two memory verses one that we had in this session, Romans 5, 8. I will read it first and then I'll, I will personalize it. But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's personalize it. But God demonstrates His own love towards me in that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And Isaiah 53 verse 4 to 5. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed let's personalize it surely he has borne my griefs and carried my sorrows yet I esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted but he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement for my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, I am healed. Amen.